Hello, my name is Jodie Brunning and today you're listening to Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility. Today I am speaking with Professor Pablo Gregorini. Pablo is Professor of Livestock Production and Agricultural Systems at Lincoln University. He's the Director of the Lincoln University Pastoral Livestock Production Lab, the Head of the Lincoln University Centre for Excellence for Designing Future Productive Landscapes. He's on the International Scientific Board of ALEF, which is a consortium of scientists working on the role of animal foods in healthy, sustainable and ethical diets. Pablo's master's was from the Universidad Nacional de la Plata, Argentina, where he's from, and his PhD was from the University of Arkansas under Stacey Gunter. He's in the past, he's been a senior scientist and he's worked at the Department of Agriculture in the United States, um, the Institute of Grasslands and Environmental Research in the United Kingdom, in Buenos Aires and in with the Wagen, Wagen, Wageninian, sorry, University Wagen. in the Netherlands. <laughs> How do we pronounce that, Pablo? Oh, Wageningen. Yes. And um, with Dairy NZ in New Zealand. So um, thank you so much for coming on today. We're, we're going to talk about complexity and chaos and secondary compounds. It's just great to have you here. No, thank you very much. It's a pleasure. No, thank you for your kind words as well. Now, I'm going to ask you a very sort of simple question to start off with before we dive into your papers. Um, mm -hmm. I have young people and I'm surrounded by young people and I see many of them shifting to vegetarian or vegan diets and they see animal farming as a blight on the planet full of suffering and they consider that animal farming you know, drives climate change. They want to tread lightly and they want to protect planetary health. Um, but could you give me a short summary because many of your papers talk about this but why do you think young people might consider eating meat? And I understand that you've got multiple perspectives to explain why you think this. Yeah, well, the, I, I hope I can summarize it uh, relatively short. One of the things that we've been seeing lately is, la, is that for, for the sake of health or in the pursuit of health, some young people and communities and high income societies, which we need to, to make clear, right? The high income societies or some people, some communities, uh, for that pursuit of health, they are demanding uh, foodscapes in the, uh, with the absence of, of animals in their plate, right? To put it in a way. And uh, uh, you can argue that that's fair enough. You know, considering that health as defined by WHO is not only the absence by the presence of physical and mental well-being from the whole thing, right? But I think um, when I really think of that, I I really think that th those people are deceived, you know, because if you start from that in the pursuit of health that doesn't mean that uh, animal products are unhealthy that's one thing uh oh, oh animal products are, are not unhealthy they are deceived by, by the allowed minority in the world especially from the north um, on that and the, on another hand you know, we can say that well animal products and and animal production systems, you know, or are are still ethical, are still um, worthwhile investigate, even from a climate and, and environmental impact point of view, when we hear that uh, taking animals off the plate will help in reduce environmental impact. From a human standpoint of view as well, all the claims that are made are, just, are not, based on the massive literature review we have conducted, are uh, epidemi epidemiological studies and not cause and effect. In fact, a lot of the claims are tainted 
uh, confounded by the actual study per se. So when, when young people, which are, as we recognize, you know, young people and other people, uh, which acknowledge the interrelationship between land, between the plants, between the animal and us as a whole, you know, and the, the enhancement of that land, of the Tatai of the next generation. Uh, if you look at that, acknowledging that, farmers acknowledge that as well, policy makers acknowledge that as well, so everybody acknowledges that. So without being critiqued to those young people and the people that want to go vegan for those particular reasons, animal welfare, uh, human health, environmental impact, and you name it, I must um, disagree with them and encourage them to to get scientific data to to support their claim as opposed to our claims that we used to say look look at that is not the way you think right hopefully I can I, I summarize it in a, in a in a relatively short and good way um, yeah so I invite those young fellows to 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 get good information behind those claims uh, or if they are again uh, going that direction in pursuit of a health of defined by WHO or even a health from a human point of view per se or a health of an environment point of view. Herbivores not only nourish us, right, but nourish the land. By consuming, we consume ourselves and we are part of the land as a whole, right? Biochemically, spiritually. So considering the taking the animal off of our plate, uh, from my point of view and from my scientific point of view, may not be healthy for the landscape, from our thoughtscapes and our healthscapes. Thank you. And that makes me think about closed loop systems so for example many young people like the idea of recycling and i know that many farmers will rotate they'll rotate a high value crop then they'll rotate it and you know the an animal they might have an animal on that pasture for the year and then they might have for example a a, a fodder crop or a legume crop and they their farm might need more nutrients if they were not rotating animals through that cycle to improve soil. Exactly, exactly, and that's that. That's a good point of uh, from a farming point of view. You know that cyclicity, if you like, that circularity, if you like, and using the animal as a vehicle of not only supplying nutrients to the rest of the system, but also processing nutrients and making those nutrients available to other components of that system, right? That's what we call holistic. Uh, but also when you look at the animal per se, the, the intensive farming, if you like, that as we were just talking about, rotations using the animals uh, as a part of the, an integrated system, not a mixed system. And let's not confuse that. One thing is a mixed system, the other thing is an integrated system. That call to the symbiotic uh, relationship between soil plant animal and the farmer as well. So that's what I call integrated system. That simply a mosaic in the landscape populated with different systems that they don't talk to each other. But going back to the animal per se, the animal provide other services to the ecosystem, which we are all included, right? We tend to think about ecosystem services, kind of look at it at a very anthropocentric point of view. But once we acknowledge that we are part of the ecosystem services, not only the ecosystem, the ecosystem provides services to us, but us to the ecosystem and the animal to the ecosystem and the animals to us and so on. So it's that complex interaction among, uh, amongst all of them that enable us to to, to say that the animal is a key part of that. How imagine that if we, now, even I'm just gonna say something that people may not like, you know, now we, you know, what grasslands and, and rangelands in New Zealand, high hill country, 
despite that we talk talking about the invasion of the earth, the invasion of tar, those regions and grasslands, you know, are already co-evolving with those uh, wild herbivores, and they are co-evolving with the domesticated herbivores. You know, so nothing is pristine. You know what? Well, today it's a local. Yesterday it was an invader. So well now we those grasslands, like in any other native grasslands around the world, they have received received new herbivores, new invaders that co-evolve with them and make them to transform to a better way, right? If 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 you, if we can say something like that, yeah. And and from what I shape. understand, um, in the pre pre man bird herbivores had adapted to every height and so they fill in those ecolo ecological niches and so now we have animal herbivores and I guess the the contract we should have with the land is that we don't overstock and when when we don't have sufficient I guess informational feedback loops between research and and agriculture that that will very likely happen um, but I would also like to ask you about what do, how do you call, what do you mean by upcycling? Because I think a lot of people think we just produce very good um, cereal crops for, for herbivores, um, so for sheep and, um, and beef, for example. But, but you, you talk about upcycling. How does that happen? Well, I probably I meant recycling, recycling nutrients to make uh, uh, those nutrients available for other sy system components. That's what and, I mean by that, that upcycling. Yes, and but also I think stock will eat, they might eat chaff, they might eat elements of the crop that humans won't eat. Yeah, exactly. And and those are, you know, if we call it that way, that is exactly, you know, the, the, the animals, the ruminant in this particular case, or any other life that may be using some of those plants or components, you know, that we may not be able to utilize directly for our nourishment. So we nourish them and they will end up nourishing us and then we'll nourish the rest of the system and so on, as eventually we'll nourish the soil when we feed the worms. Yeah. Absolutely. And of course, when we talk about livestock in a, in a grazing situation, we're not talking about feedlotting. We're not talking about stock in crates. And so moving to a situation where we can prioritize and value stock that are in pastoral systems that are free roaming, is a very necessary nuance that's often left left out of the sort of vegan vegetarian debate. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, when when we look at that uh, about livestock production, especially livestock production in gra in grazing lands, grasslands, or grangelands, or systems that are embedded in that sort of landscape, uh, we think of animals in general that are given the the chance to to wander around, to roam in, and to make their own decisions, especially at the more extensive or less intensive production systems. Right? That, that we give them the chance to utilize that landscape and to learn from that landscape and trans, transfer that learning through the next future generations that enable them to transcend, but also to transcend and co-evolve with that particular foodscape, right? Which is in that landscape. Now, a different story is a the more intensive uh, livestock production uh, system or, or even a grazing system, which lately have been quite questioned by the society and policymakers in terms of the environmental impact, right? So not everything is rosy simply because the animal graze, right? So animals, Animals that are not only constrained uh, dietarily, uh, but also constrained uh, behaviorally and emotionally. So I argue that from an intensive point of view, intensive pastoral systems um, may not even take the five freedoms. And by restricting them to make choices, 
uh, they may not be ethical. I know this is not the music that a lot of people would like to hear, but the good thing is like uh, we can, by design rather than default, think of design and implement grazing systems either extensively or intensively that allow the animal to express those innate behaviors to have choice and so on. That may end up being beneficial, not only for the animal, but the farmer, farmer and ourselves. And just to finish off on this short segment here, you make me think about people when they are essentially eating, for example, an ultra processed food diet, which is primarily composed of five sort of significant food crops. Um, many of which have a high spray spray regime attached to them. So there's a question in terms of what happens to the environment in terms of pollution there. And so they're, they're, they have a misleading sort of impression of how much choice they have when they're really eating the same food crop over and over again. And so if you see a, an animal that is in a, a, a narrow system with a narrow pasture, they've, they've sort of got the same food choices. And I guess there is a, it, it's inherent, it, it's incumbent upon us as humans to not just make food choices better for animals, for livestock animals, but to make them better for humans. I think we're facing the same problem at every level. Would you oh, say that? Oh, exactly. And uh, as you know, we 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 are investigating that, and we've been investigating that, and we we've been connecting soil plant animals and and humans and that. And I can give you that uh, an example of that. But uh, I, I would like to, sorry, I would like to get you know into the first sentence where we 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 talk about uh, you know those youngster you know going vegetarian because of problems of ethics, environmental impact, or human health to, to wrap up this section. And, and then uh, uh, we can get into to choice in animals and dietary diversity and functional diversity. One thing that we, we put together with Frederick Leroy in that invited review is like when we talk about the, the impact of uh, the vegetarian diet, versus a vegan diet, versus a flexitarian diet, you name it. In the, the average carbon um, carbon footprint of worldwide per person, right? So we, we find out that, in fact, even if you go to roughly to a, a flexitarian diet or even a conventional diet, the diet per se is only, or contributes only 10, percent of our total carbon footprint. Right? If we go to a flexitarian diet, you reduce it a little bit. The numbers are in the paper, but if you go all the way to, to a vegan diet, you go back to uh, from 10 to 6%. Right? So it is not significant. You know, it, it doesn't have much of impact from a carbon point of view to become a vegan to put it in a way. And the details are in the paper. That's one thing. From another point of view, imagine that from even tied it with the environmental point of view, you would say, well, if we go vegan, right? And we know that the plants are less dense in terms of nutrients and less rich in terms of nutrients and nutrients that are essential for humans are lacking of plants. So what we need to do is just grow more plants, right? Especially if you are gonna be eating more plants, you know, you need to eat more to compensate for that. When you look at that, imagine that you need to increase the cropping area massively, right? And you need to start using pesticides and so on to grow those crops. So first of all, from a pollution point of view, I question that. Right? And then from an environmental impact point of view, you're displacing or you're taking land from nature to grow uh, particular uh, vegetables or plants. 
typical example it may imagine that you know the South America the invasion of soybeans and so on and soybean is key in those vegetarian diets no wonder about the intensive production of vegetables there as well but imagine in addition to that if you're looking from animal welfare and ethics or bioethics when you're displacing animals from the wild or from the wild or you you corral them in smaller areas because you want to advance with cropping uh how many animals you kill for that how many ecosystems you destroy for the sake of having a vegetarian or vegan diet if we keep talking about density and in that paper we also published that i think it's one gram of a ruminant liver in essential nutrients for humans is equivalent to a half a kilo of oranges so when you put that in the context you can see you know that the, the numbers that don't add up from an ethical point of view uh, you know farming animals and livestock animals uh if we do the things right right they're well taken care of by the vets by the farmer per se simply because you're a farmer are producing food that doesn't mean that it's unethical and so on so, but yeah, those those are the things that I mentioned. Those youngsters are going vegan. Need to think. If it is a climate thing, well, rethink about it. If it is environmental and wildlife protection, well, you may want to think about it. If it is uh, nutrient dense and there is evidence now that vegan diets lead to men uh, depression, you know, vegan diets lead to early birth and so on. Uh, so I would invite them to to review the scientific or oh, just call me and so I can provide you with more information to literally make an informed scientific decision about that rather than being deceived by some celebrity in Hollywood that is encouraged by some big companies to go to vegan reason. And and we know that for example, in India, where there is a long history of vegetarian diets, and I may have been talking about this with Professor Grant Schofield in a, a recent interview, that you'll find that grandmother lives at home and you've got multiple generations, you've got extremely expert cooking skills. And one of the things I notice is that um, in, say, vegetarian Indian diets, sag um, with the silver beet or the spinach is very eaten a lot there's a lot of that eaten and when of course I look on this paper we're talking about 2022 Frederick Leroy et al the animal board environment invited review in um, the journal animal what we see is that silver bit spinach is similar to meat but I see many many vegetarian kids that really don't eat that much of those dark leafy greens that the ancestral vegetarian diets do eat and so particularly for young for women of childbearing age this is a big concern so the gender impact will will be very different and so I think for young people um, and people in general they need to really investigate why they might be craving certain food and this the place of meat so thank you for that Oh, exactly. Yeah. We we were we were hunter and gatherers, you know, as we we put with Frederick as well in the previous papers. We we, we talk about um, from thoughtscapes to foodscapes. Um, a while ago, you know, we were celebrating the killing in a good way, the killing of that gray bull, but then everything got all the way distorted. So nowadays that we are in an era that we saw it's cute. So let's not kill Bambi because it's cute. Well, Bambi not only has a function in nature, right? There's a function in those landscapes, but also has a function in nourishing us. Yeah. So when you know we went from celebrating a hunt all the way to flesh eaters and now being bad because that animal is cute. But yeah. I need to disclose it. I'm a massive carnivore. So <laughs> And but you also come from you were explaining your background and you come from a, a very ethical. Your your father was um, uh, your or your mother was a theosopher? theologian. Yeah, theologian. Yeah, exactly. And and we we in fact I put an article I should have sent you before with Tom Maxwell where we talk about ethical and sustainable foodscapes when we discuss about ethics and sustainability as well.
and maybe we go into detail of what it means to be ethical or just thinking of ethical and sustainable agriculture, especially of livestock. But going back to, to, to what you were talking before, uh, uh, you know, um, monotony versus diversity, you know, uh, uh, traveling around, you know, not only here, but in other places, you see a lot of monotony in the landscapes, you know, monotony, monotony on those foodscapes that are embedded on those landscapes. And you can into those farms that are um, that have a desert of rye grass or a desert of lucerne, if you like. Just I'm I'm not against any of those plants. They're just providing an example. But at the very end of the day, uh, first of all, there are not resilience because they lack of diversity, right? Uh, and the the lack of diversity, the lack of redundancy. But when you look at the dietary point of view. Uh, or from a dietary point of view, offering monotony, it's, it's not good for anybody. If you imagine that I offer you the best food, or the, the food that you like the most, and I offer that to you day in and out. I'm asking, let's say, imagine that you want, you like pasta, right? Oh, that's cool. Okay, pasta, dinner, oh, tomorrow in breakfast, by the way, you got pasta, lunch, you got pasta, and, and so on, right? What happened there is, like, not only us, but the animal get tired of it and sick of it. And we got scientific evidence of that, you know, with particular markers that we can say that the animal is not happy, if you like, or is uncomfortable, and they get into oxidative and physiological stress if that monotony persists over time. But the monotony per se is not only, you know, one single food. You know, imagine that uh, you, Jody, ask me, well, Paolo, can you formulate the best diet ever for me with a multitude, multitude of nutrients and a multitude of, multitude of foods? And then I give you that the same over and over, right? Continuously. You'll also get tired of it and sick of it. Pretty much your neurons, as the first example as well, stop working. Stop working because oh, it's all the same. Oh, once again. So they stop working. So they are not stimulated to keep eating. Right? And if you don't eat, you get into trouble. Right? So when we talk about going from a monotonous diet, it's not only going from a monoculture or boring landscape or desert, deserts of mm -hmm. rye grass, fodder beet or lucerne or plantain or whatever. It's just make those environments literally more diverse, redundancy, abundant, uh, uh, and rich taxonomically and biochemically. And when we talk about diversity and those sort of things as well, it's not biochemically rich per se, taxonomically rich per se, diversity per se. Like a typical example, oh, well, let's make the pastures diverse. We put 30 species there. We lately have evidence that it is way more important to think of functional diversity rather than taxonomically or plant diversity per se. And we've got data that indicates that when we think of the soil, the animal, right, from a taxonomical point of view, from a biochemical point of view, and the animal per se interacting in that foodscape, getting that diversity functional, it's way more important than diversity per se. It's like the paradox of the mixed salad. Imagine that I give you a mixed salad, that's fine, but I offer you a spoon to eat. Well, we rather offer you a salad bar when you can make your own individual decision and have discrete plates, patches of food that enable you to literally express yourself much better without frustration. And that's what we find out that that seems to be way more important than the taxonomically or biochemical diversity per se. We lately have been run, you know, experiments that compare status quo of rye grass or lucerne as opposed to pastures of 30 species as competing against, you know, what we call functional diversity. Well, we explicitly make sel or, or select plants biochemically and taxonomically and make them discrete 
in the foodscape in the paddock for the animal to be able to perceive them visually, you know, uh, 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 and make that call according to the size of the animal. I know I'm getting technical. No, no, no. So this is not technical. So, it, so what we're saying instead of a cocktail of different seed species producing different plant species all mixed in together, you're planting strip rows. So exactly. the, anim the animal can move from row to row. Exactly. We we offer them, you know, frontally, right? So transversally to those roads. And, and the animal have literally the option of where to graze, right? Rather than all competing at the same time in a super mix salad. Yeah. When you look at from that point of view and you go into rangelands and extensive grasslands, you know, there are literally patches of communities up through those environments that the animal can perceive with their vision or their sight and their smell and other orosensorial uh, senses, right? That, and that's why the animal move from one place to the other because they may want to make that decision. Well, now I eat a salad, then I eat a steak. Later on, I did that ice cream rather than having the salad, the steak, and the ice cream in one full spoon, right? Well, hopefully that metaphor explained that. Uh, that that is. I got a master student, Kelly Spain, that we were talking about that. And we said, well, how can we express that in a way? And she brought to me a jar full of, of candies with different flavors. And she told me, well, Paolo, now you pick the ones that you like, right? And I was just trying to get my hands in there, trying to pick one and the other. And she told me, well, what if I just get those candies and I put it in different jars and now you pick what you like? Well, it was way easier for me. So what would animals happen the same? From a more technical and practical point of view, we have been trialing that. You know, we, you know, same pasture allowance, same pasture uh, cover, same residuals, and let the animal decide, let their nutritional wisdom decide, sequences, and let them express their own individuality in space and time and within the context of the herd, because they have personalities. So we are enabling them to work more harmoniously with the whole foodscape rather than pressure them to eat something in particular because we think that is better for them. So we've run experiments with dairy cows, with deer, with sheep, with lamb, with beef cattle. And all of those experiments show us that when we provide that choice as opposed to the mix, as opposed to monotony, the animal performs better the animals have a better well-being. Even the fetus to be born show less stress. That's what we call it. We can program emotions. And we are working on that already. But when we analyze the, the even the metabolomic profile, the nutraceutical properties of those animal tissues, if you like, the arrangement, those macromolecules, for us, seems to be better, right? So we have evidence now that a functional diverse diet is better nutraceutically for us that milk, uh, and milk, for example, that milk coming from a monotonous diet of rye grass. I'm not saying that is bad because they have benefits, but I'm saying that could be something better, right? So we add into that. And that you need to be quite clear because it's easy to point fingers. Um, we are not saying that's bad, this is good. We are saying that is good. Well, this can be even better. Right? And we have same, the same results with, with venison, the same results with sheep, the same results with beef cattle. And we went even further. And, 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 and uh, uh, as you are aware, we, we run uh, human trials with beef and that translate into the metabolomics of the metabolite expression of humans after eating beef coming from those three treatments, which at the end of the day, you know, literally shows that our health is a reflection of how we treat that foodscape, how we treat that animal, how we graze them. 
metabolomic profiling is so looking at is looking at the chemical fingerprints you know the cell processes that that we see from from say changing the diet and so this is that you're talking about there's a it's a preprint at the moment with anita fleming called connecting plant animal and human health using untargeted meta metabolomics and that's the first time this has been done yes definitely and kudos to anita anita is a postdoctoral fellow of the center of excellence that uh, uh, you had and it's a key member of the lincoln university pastoral life the production lab and by the way, she's a farmer, which, right? Uh, so keeping, you know, Anita was my PhD student then, like she said, I'll keep you real, Pablo. <laughs> That's really great. And that was that trial. So, so this trial was with 23 people. Oh, uh, look, it is, um, uh, there was exactly, it was 23 people and then a crossover design, right? So we, we, all those people went through all those that, right? And it's the first trial in the world that is cause and effect, right? So you eat this and then you'll reflect it in your health, in your blood that we sample. And we get now another postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Sagara Kumara, that is repeating that with lamb. And in addition to that, he's uh, evaluating orosensorial experiences and, um, and perceptions of people while they are eating that as well and the, the effect of those treatments, not only in the lamb and the lamb uh, meat quality and the milk quality of the ewe, but also the effect on the soil with excellent uh, results so far that I can't disclose yet because he hasn't published it yet. Ah, excellent. Stay and tuned because I, I'm quite excited about that. Yeah, and of course, so with just 23 people, this is, you know, low powered and it was seven days where people would have I cooked 250 grams, more women than men, 250 grams of cooked beef. And mm. then, and so they found that the diet was anti-inflammatory and that there was many more, you know, the expression in the blood samples was of massive health benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, of course, when you compare to those massive epidemiological studies, uh, the, yeah, you, so you, you could argue, well, you don't have many people, but for us to have uh, 23 people, you know, in a crossover design, you know, uh, that's, you know, the, the, the same design helped, uh, experimental design helped to reduce the need of many people, right? Yes. But, and, you know, we we run a power analysis, we run the uh, crossover design experiment, it can't get cleaner than that, and it's the cause and effect. So we you eat that, you'll show that in, in your blood. Yes, and of course, it was a, a massive effect of increase on vitamin gamma tocopherol, or one of the vitamin E's in, 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 in people, which is the most potent uh, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and even it's uh, inversely related to colon cancer. And, you know, when we, uh, when we run, uh, you know, there were other uh, metabolites that were significant in the blood of people with a, a false discovery rate that enabled us to say most likely that will happen. And, you know, things that are related to cardiovascular diseases, things that are re related to kidney disease, and uh, things that may be related to mental state, uh, especially when, when we go to venison as well, we got a lot of, uh, you know, of difference, mark, marked difference in betaines and some other things that are related to of fetal uh, brain development and cognition and diabetes, uh, you name it. 